if nature has a speed limit, if an infinite rate of motion is not possible, then nature's speed limit is an absolute motion. And any sphere expanding at that rate defines a reference frame that is at absolute rest. If you like this, but would like a more in-depth explanation, I have an example that goes into this further. An example I like to call the helicopter example. Later, I'll make a dedicated video of the helicopter example for you. I just don't have time for it here. Let me emphasize, time does not expand along only one dimension of space. Time expands in all three dimensions of space. Time is not the fourth dimension of space. Since Einstein, it has become popular to treat space and time in the same way, as if they have the same properties. You frequently hear people use terms like space-time and 4D space-time. Of course, mathematically, it is of little concern to work in four dimensions, or more dimensions for that matter. However, physically, this is incorrect. We must remember space and time have different properties. After all, we give the two ideas different names for a reason. Space is a measure of extent. It is a measure of an object's height, width, and length. Time is a measure of motion. Time is used to measure how fast something is moving through space. Space is just three-dimensional. We travel through space as does time. Prior to Einstein's theories, space was thought of as just a non-changing backdrop with physical events happening in space. Forces did not affect or distort space itself. Using this new physics, with time defined to travel at nature's fastest motion, the distorting, the dilating, the contracting, that, once again, all comes out of space and time, and once again goes back into the elementary particle. In this new physics, space is once again treated as a non-changing backdrop to what is happening in it. To some people, the idea that space can be affected by forces or that it can be cut in some way so that there is a hole in space is a proposition that is crazy. While we can cut a hole in some physical material, we cannot cut a hole in space itself. What will we use as the knife? To other people, the proposition that space is just a backdrop, that space itself cannot be modified, is equally wrong. Historically, this is a philosophical argument that has been going on for over a hundred years. The fact is, this is simply an argument where neither side of the argument can ever be proven. Logically, both sides of this argument can never be proven. In essence, this is a useless battle. At present, it is popular in astronomy to say that space itself is expanding. Astronomers love to give an analogy of an expanding balloon covered with dots all over its surface. This is an absurd analogy. Despite the ardent arguments in favor of the view that space itself is expanding, this is a view that simply cannot be proven. It will always be impossible to compare a non-changing volume of space to a changing volume of space. The reason is we cannot see or sense in any way space itself. None of our senses can sense space. By definition, space is empty. We can only sense things in space. It is equally valid to say that any differences that are found, differences that might be attributed to space, are only due to something happening to the matter and energy in space, not to space itself. Neither side of this argument can ever be proven. To summarize, through most of history, the sun's apparent motion is what we have called time. It is not practical to use a shadow of the sun's motion to measure other motions in our modern life. Therefore, we have developed clocks to create copies of the sun's motion. The hands on a clock have motions that are multiples of the sun's motion. Now, at this point in history, we measure motions by comparing how fast something is moving to the motions we have defined on clocks. These motions might be something as simple as how fast we are walking or running 
like through an airport terminal at LAX, in order to make our flight on time, to how fast our car is moving towards the airport, to motions as precise as the spinning turbine blades in a jet's engine, or as complex and precise as the electronic signals in the airplane's computer. It doesn't matter if we are measuring motions as slow as 5 miles an hour. It doesn't matter if we are measuring something moving 200 million meters per second. It doesn't matter if we are measuring with the precision of microseconds, milliseconds, or picoseconds. The key detail is, if you are measuring motions using any of the traditional definitions for time, based upon things like years, months, days, hours, minutes, or seconds, then you are making a mistake. All of our historical standards of motion are bad. Einstein developed one technique to equate our clocks. That is the purpose of special relativity. I developed another technique. Instead of having our clocks speed up and slow down, we need to define time to travel at nature's fastest motion, the speed of light. This simple idea solves the mystery of time. This is a major turning point in physics. If it doesn't seem like a big deal, it is. It creates two entirely different classes of physics. It is life-changing. In this new physics, in one fell swoop, this simple definition for time dramatically changes many areas of physics and astronomy. Now, this concludes the introduction to time. I wish I had more time here to talk about time and space in more detail. Think of this as a basic primer on time. If you have an interest in physics or if you are a scientist, then I should point out there is more that you need to understand about time, like a detailed explanation for the arrow of time and how this view of time affects our understanding of astronomy and the Big Bang. There's going to be a transition period where people move back and forth between Einstein's physics and this new type of physics. It can be confusing. It requires some thought. In the end, understanding time is going to modify many physics theories and many areas of astronomy, but it will be worth it. If you are interested in time, then I recommend keeping an eye out for two videos I will make later. They are called the New Year's Eve example and the helicopter example. They are simple examples. They do not require any knowledge of advanced physics. They are the type of oh, wow examples that a non-physics person can use anytime to explain time to other people in everyday conversations. If you enjoy finally understanding time, or if you would like to help support my work, then please consider making a donation at my website. Now, we have the key to this new knowledge. Let us unlock that door and walk to the center of the physics labyrinth. Let me show you what I found there. It is the grand unification of physics.